and welcome to my tennis coaching, my doubles, and today's presentation on how to dominate the match. I'm going to show you how to win more doubles matches, which is what we all want. We all want to win more matches. We are going to show you how doubles is actually played. A lot of people play doubles, but play it wrong. I'm going to show you how to play doubles effectively. And we're going to look at the pro game and look at what the top players do and look at good practice. And if we can translate that into our own matches, we're definitely going to win more matches. I'm also going to show you the tennis skills that you need. I'm going to look at sort of more about positioning in terms of anything else. Doubles is a team game. It's about working together to win points. And on that note, I'm going to show you what territory is. I'm going to show you what you need to cover, what your partner covers. And I'm going to show you why the net player is the most important person on the court. And I'm also going to show you why the net player has to do the most movement. A lot of people play doubles and the net player stood very still. But I'm going to show you why the net player is probably the most active player on the court. So this is going to be a pretty good, interesting presentation. So who I am, some of you probably would have seen me on social media, at My Tennis Coaching, on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn. Uh, but who actually am I? So I've been a tennis coach for over 20 years. I've worked with beginners uh, up to national level juniors mainly specialize in junior tennis, um, talent ID and, and sort of talent attraction. So working with sort of under 10 performance players is mainly my sort of niche. That's my sort of area of expertise. Uh, but I've worked with all ages and all stages of players. I've been a coach educator for eight years. So I deliver coach education courses here in the UK uh, and coach workshops. In terms of team tennis, I'm a county coach, so I coach for Buckinghamshire here in the UK, and I look after the under-12 girls team. Doubles is a huge part of county tennis. Um, most years at County Cup, which is the big event each year, a lot of the matches are decided on the doubles. I've been team captain at club level as well, um, and most club tennis here in the UK is club-based. So since I've been coaching 20-odd years, I've played a lot of doubles matches. I've won some matches, I've lost some matches, Um and I only wish now, sort of then, what, what I knew now. And I know much more about doubles. Um, and I definitely would have won more doubles matches if I would have used this framework, which I'm going to show you today. I'm also a qualified tennis analyst as well through Tennis Analytics. So we're going to show you quite a lot of stats and stuff today. And a big part of performance coaching is analyzing data and sort of seeing what the top players are doing and why it's so effective. Um, so I've done a course on that as well. So I do have a bit of background when I'm talking about stats and analyzing matches. So why is doubles important? So I mentioned there about County Cup. Doubles is, is very important in international events. So if you think about the Davis Cup or the Billie Jean King Cup, a lot of those rubbers are decided. Sorry, a lot of those matches are also sort of decided on a doubles rubber. Um, Great Britain have been highly successful over the last couple of years and we won Davis Cup a few years ago because our double strength, because we because we were so good at doubles, we would not decide in tie a lot of the time. Um, and especially with, with Davis Cup, if you play a two singles, or also the old format, so sort of you 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 play a two singles on the Friday. Um if you win that doubles on the on sort of day two, it, it can really swing the momentum of the tie. So it's it's really important at international level. Doubles also now is a lot of players are making good careers in doubles with the prize money and stuff going up in doubles. Um, a lot of players who qu quite haven't got it on the singles court are now having very highly successful doubles careers. Uh, again, here in the Great Britain, I would say we're probably one of the strongest doubles countries in the world now with uh, with, with with some top, top players uh, winning multiple Grand Slams. And part of it is some of the framework that Louis Kaye brought in. And that's what I'm going to show you today. And here in the UK, over 100,000 adults play doubles each week, according to the LTA. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it's court space, court utilisation. You can get four players on the court playing doubles. You can only get two playing singles. A lot of club players here in the UK believe doubles is easier. I'm going to show you today why it's probably not that way. Um, and people think there's less running in, in, in doubles. There's less court space to cover. But I wouldn't say there's less movement, especially when you're the net player. But very popular game here in the UK. But in, again, my experience, 20 years coaching, played badly, played not very well. And people sort of don't know how to play doubles. They just think it's all about hitting the ball and waiting for your opponent to miss. But I'm going to show you that's not the case. And doubles players, you've got to be a complete tennis player because you're going to find yourself in all five situations. You're, you're going to find yourself serving, returning. You're going to find yourself playing at the baseline. You're going to find yourself playing at the net. You're going to have to deal with your opponent at the net. That's tough. 
in singles, you might serve and stay back for the whole match. You might not go into the net. I know that's how I play my singles. Uh, but in doubles, you can't hide. If 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 you're weak at the net, it's going to get sort of showing. So doubles players tend to be more all-rounded players. They're good in all areas. And most importantly, doubles is a team game. You've got two players on the court, so you have to work together. Like any team sport in the world, whether it be basketball, football, athletics, soccer, American football, you have to work together. You 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 have to work as a team, set each other up, support each other. And that's what's good about doubles. Tennis is quite a tough game mentally if it's singles because the pressure's all on you. In doubles, you've got a partner there, which, again, can work the other way around as well. Sometimes you can be stressed so much about what you're your partner's doing or you might be stressed of sort of letting your partner down but doubles is a team game and you've got to work with your partner so this is how club play uh, club doubles is played here in the UK and we've got two players at the baseline trading it out two very static net players and net players not doing very much and yeah they sort of decide to sit down this is I think an exhibition match a few years ago uh, in Australia, and but this this is how it's played here in the UK, especially at club level. Just the baseliners are trying to trying to win the point. They're just rallying, and the net players don't want to get involved. But and sort of they might may, may not leave the court as such as extreme as that, but they may hang around the outside tram line, or they may just not want to get involved. And then it just just becomes a battle of both back and baseline to baseline. I don't think they quite do sort of some showboat in there. Um, but that, that's how it's played. It's it's played very much baseline to baseline, and that play is not doing very much. So the two players play independently, little or no communication. You may sort of walk on the court, and say hi, how are you doing? How's your day been? How was work? And that's the last time you communicate them. The occasional well done or unlucky or mine or yours, but very little communication in the match. Players will take up the positions like the pros. So why do you go one up, one back? It's a question that I ask quite a lot when I take over uh, club teams or if I am working on sort of doubles workshops and stuff. The first question I ask is, why are you taking those positions up? And no one actually knows. I always get the, the, the common one. Well, that's what the top players do, or that's what my coach told me to do. You should play one up, one back. The net player should try and get the ball, and the baseline covers the back of the court, or one player's cover left, one player's cover right. But they, they have no idea. They have no idea why they're standing in those positions and they just do it because they've either been half told a story or they watch TV or they go to a tennis event like Wimbledon they say and they'll see one up, one back, but they won't actually know why. The net player is often isolating out the point. So again, in that sort of little funny clip, you can see the net player was just sort of stood there and I see it a lot and, and I seen it recently when I was watching the match. The net player just stood in one spot, watching the ball, just turning their head backwards and forwards, watching the ball. Little or no idea what they should be doing. Um, one of the common sort of comments that I get given as a coach is, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to leave. I don't know what to sort of go for. I, I'm just standing here, but I feel lost. And I, then I get stressed and I get anxious. And then, I'm, then I miss a volley and then I don't want to get involved. I, I just don't like it. So it's quite an important position, which we'll look at today. But you really need to understand of of not being isolated and being in the point and not out of the point. And the baseline is trying to win the point. The baseline is probably have little court space. They've got no angles to attack, but they'll just try and win the point. They'll try and out hit the other baseliner and out rally them, even though they haven't got any <laughs> any angles or space. They'll attack down the line, which is which is crazy, which is the hardest shot to hit. They'll try and attack the net play and give away lots of cheap points if the net player's got good hands. So it's not the baseliner's job to win the point. But again, club level, most baseliners try and win from the base uh, from the back of the court. And the players cover side left and right. We don't we don't really cover that a lot in this presentation, but it's not about left and right. It's about space. Who covers what space? And we'll, we'll look mainly today in this presentation about, okay, what does the server cover? What does the returner cover? And then possibly in future presentations in this My Double series, we'll look at sort of how territory changes during the rally situation as well and the return. Okay, so our first real module is, let's look at how doubles is actually played. 
this is the reality of doubles. Wow. Short, sharp, effective. Serve. Return. Ball three. Potential ball four. Very short points. Net plays, active, engaged, high intensity. I love doubles. So let's look at some stats, the facts. And these stats are from Craig O'Shaughnessy. For those of you who know Craig, he's probably the leading tennis analytics expert in the world. He's done lots of presentations on tennis stats, uh, which is still fairly new. I said, we only, I believe, started analyzing matches in, I think, the late 70s, maybe early 80s in terms of match stats. And only over the last couple of years have we started to really harvest all this data. I know at the LTA, they will start and tag most matches now that sort of their players play. Uh, and they start building ideas of how the game is actually played. Because sometimes we play tennis and we see things differently than what stats tell us. I know in the past I've gone to matches to watch my players and when we've had the little debrief at the end, their reflection on the match is completely different to what I've analysed or what I've written down in the notes because I would go there and I'd, I'd analyse maybe first serve percentage, how many mistakes they made with a forehand or backhand, how many winners they hit from certain areas. And players don't see that because they're so caught up in the emotion of the match. And generally speaking, our conscious mind only ever sees bad things. They they only see what we do badly. And it's, it's interesting because when you ever speak to a player at the end of a match and you say, oh, how did that go? It's always just the negative stuff they give you first because their conscious mind is, is I've got to improve or I lost that match because of. Um, and more often than not, it's, it's not the reality. And that's why I find doing the match tagging and the match analysis as part of, of, of my tennis coaching really interesting because when I get the reports from players, it's often different to what the stats tell me. So when I tag the match using um, swing vision or, or dartfish, the, the the stats don't actually reflect what the players tell me. And the great thing about stats is they don't lie. So the first thing that you're going to notice with double stats is the serving team has a huge advantage. The winning team, so the team that wins the match, on average wins 64% of the points on their serve. So if you want to win a doubles match, you've got to win more points when you're serving. Yeah, it's not about breaking serve. It's about holding serve. So 64% of the points on average are won by the winning team on serve. The first serve percentage goes up in double, 69%. That's not to say they don't hit the serve as hard, but they're not trying to hit aces. They're not trying to win many cheap points. And we'll look at it today in this presentation. The main part with the serving team is to set up the net player. 35% of points are won by a missed return, which is, which is quite high. And the reason for that is the there's a lot of pressure on the returner. You've got less angle, you've got less space. And also when you play doubles, you know that the server is trying to set up the net player. So you're really conscious of that net player is going to look to put themselves in the position. They know where the serve is going to go. Well, they should know, which we'll look at today. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on you. So you may try and overcook and do too much with your return. The net player is key. 68%, 68% of points are won at the net. 84% of winners are made by the net player. 51% of errors are made by the baseliner. Doubles is won at the net. It's not won at the baseline. And like I mentioned before in the previous module, a lot of club players try and win the point from the baseline. It just, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you really have to try and understand that the net play is key here. The net players are going to win the majority of the points because they're closest to the action. It's a lot easier to win the point at the net than it is the baseline. You've got more angles, you've got more space. You're also a lot closer to the net, uh, sorry, a lot closer to your opponent. So when you hit that ball, your opponents have less time. They potentially have less space as well. So it's a lot easier to win. It's, it's what we call the point ending zone. It's like any sport in the world. So if you think football or soccer, if you're from the United States, if I want to score, I've got to get close to your goal. In tennis, if I want to win easy points, I've got to get close to the net because the angles open up. I take time and space away from my opponent. 
very difficult to win from the baseline. And the error stat there is quite interesting because, again, a bit like we talk about the returner, the the pressure is on the baseliner. You've got less angles, you've got less space. You, you are also conscious that a net player who's trying to intercept your shot. So, again, you're maybe trying to do too much when you're playing from the baseline. So we're going to look at sort of how we met sort of how we handle that more effectively today. And again, these stats are provided by Brain Game Tennis and Craig O'Shaughnessy. So doubles is a game of sure points. We looked at that little clip before of uh, Team GB and Belgium. Three shots, points over. The average rally is 3.8. So serve, return, ball three, ball four. And that's that's it. It's it's over quick and sharp. You you shouldn't be getting into these drawn out long rallies because believe it or not, and we'll we'll also look at it and say if if you're the serving team, once you go past ball four, the odds in you winning that point become lower. The odds are stacked in your favor between balls one and four. And that's why eighty one percent of points are won between ball one and four. They're so important. Tennis is not a game of long rallies. Even in the singles game, the average rally is just under four. Even at the French Open, people think the French Open is these really slow, drawn out rallies. They're not. Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, Raducanu, Serena. Yeah, they all looking to end the point quick. If you're playing tennis for five, six hours and you're playing five or three or three full sets, you, you don't want to be having 20, 30 shot rallies. It's it's just it's just craziness. Um, so points are short and sharp. So today in this framework, I'm going to show you. How to work as a team. That doubles is a team game. No ifs or buts about it. You have to play together. You've got to work together to force your opponent into making mistakes. It's not about waiting for them to make mistakes. It's about putting them under pressure. And it's something that Louis Kea has really installed here in Great Britain with all our doubles teams. Is It's not about hitting winners. It's not about waiting for, for, uh, for your opponent to make mistakes. It's applying pressure with our positioning and of our shot selection that forces the opponent into making mistakes. And you and you if you think about it from a player's point of view, for, for those of you who are players, and most of you will be watching this presentation, is if I hit a winner against you, you're annoyed. Yeah, you're annoyed, but you might think, no, you know what, good shot. If you if you miss, if you make an error, if you hit the net, now you're doubly annoyed. You're really annoyed because you feel that you've made the mistake. You've made that shot miss you've made that error in judgment that's more impactful from a psychological point of view because if you're being forced into making mistakes you start feeling the pressure more if someone's hitting winners it's quite easy to say yeah good shot well done too good but if you're being forced into making mistakes it creates that pressure and that's part of the battle part of the battle is applying pressure to your opponent so psychologically they 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 crumble and fall apart so it's working together with your teammate to Apply pressure aggressively with territory or core position, but also shot selection and position of the ball. And we look at developing tennis and uh, your, your tennis skills. So taking advantage of when you serve, being really solid when you're serving as a team, being able to control and dominate the net. We've looked at the stats already. The net player is probably the most dominant player on the court. So we're going to look at sort of benefiting from that and being solid in the ball one to four, whether you're serving or returning. If you're serving, try and get the point end sort of ended between balls one and four. You're returning, which we won't quite look at this one today in this presentation, surviving balls one to four. Once you get past ball four as a returning team, it becomes a bit more balanced. You you definitely have more opportunities there now to sort of to win points. Okay, so let's look at the tactical framework. So we'll look at developing your tennis skills, but mainly your tactical framework. So we look at taking advantage when we serve. We looked at the stats before. If we win the majority of our points when serving, we tend to win the match. We look to control and dominate the net. The net player wins the majority of the points. They're key to the, to, to the whole system. Being solid and ball one to four. Advantage, serving team. So when serving, we will use a net player. To, sorry, use a serve to set up the net player. The server and the net player should work together to set up ball three. Yeah, you work as a team to set up ball three. That's your number one priority when you're serving. You also need to understand what your responsibilities are, so what your job is. 
but also what space to cover. And that space we'll sort of call territory. So let's look at the starting positions. So let's look at the classic position here. So we've got we've got the one up, one back. I mentioned a little story before. Most players I come into contact with at club level, they will stand one up, one back, but they won't know why. They'll just take up those positions because, as you see in the, bit, the picture there, Jamie and Andy Murray did it on Davis Cup when I watched it on TV last week. If the top players are doing it, I'll do it. A bit like when um, Sunday league soccer teams or football teams play a 3-5-2 because Manchester City or... Everton, great team, um, will sort of play that formation. But they might not have the skills or the tactical knowledge to actually play like Pep Guardiola's team or Frank, Lamp or, or Frank Lampard's teams. So you need to understand why take up those formations, what you're meant to do, what your role is in each formation. A wing back in, in soccer or football needs to understand what their job is and what space of the pitch they play on. Same in tennis. The server needs to know what their job is, where they have to put the ball what space they need to cover. The net player needs to know what space they need to cover and what they should be looking for. So let's look at the server. Server generally stands wide towards the tram line. They stand wide at club level for a couple of reasons. One, because you need to cover the tram lines. Tram lines are in, in doubles. Two, you don't want to hit your partner in the back of the head. If you position yourself more towards the middle and closer to your partner, the angle gets a bit tighter. You're more likely to smash them in the back of the head. Um, but the service job is to mainly cover the court that the net player can't. And we're going to look at that in, 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 sort of in the slide in a minute. Now, if you watch a lot of doubles, you'll see a lot of the top doubles teams now are shifting away from this. And I noticed that at Wimbledon this year when I went across for a couple of days, um, the server has been taken up a much more central position. Um, and I think a lot of that is because a lot of these patterns that we'll sh sort of show you today, a lot of teams now know the patterns. So they're trying to change up the starting position to try and disguise it a lot more. Um, but you have to remember that these top players are serving a lot quicker. They're a lot more accurate than sort of the average club player. So I would sort of highly go against sort of a lot of the eye formations and stuff like that for, for club level. Um, I would sort of just stick to these traditional levels here. And what you'll find is most club players and regional or state players they might not know these patterns. So these classic formations still work. At the top level, it's getting tougher because everyone knows these patterns now. Um, everyone knows the success the Great Britain team have. And with analytics, people are studying uh, opposition a lot more. So some of the pro st uh, game are now starting to hide their positions a lot, a lot, a lot more. So just be careful of that. Service partner stands right in the middle of the service box. Quite an aggressive position. Most club players will hang towards the inside tram line because they're trying to protect the line. Allegedly. Um, not really. They're just scared. They just don't want to hit a volley. So they're trying to hide out the way. So the reason why we stand in the middle is, one, we have to protect the centre, which is the most important part. Yeah. Most common points that I see at club level are lost because the ball goes through the middle. Um this, the, the stats show that the ball crosses the centre window, which is the centre, if I just use my mouth, which is this position here. The ball crosses that position more than any other position on the court. I think it's something like 84%. Um, so the centre is the most important part. So by putting yourself in the middle of the service box, you are protecting the centre. And you're putting yourself in the perfect position. You're also making that court look really small. If I, if I was to position myself on the inside tram line here, I'd leave a huge gap down the center. That's a big inviting space. But by putting myself in the center here, just outlined with a yellow box, I'm limiting the space for the returner. Yeah. They haven't really got a lot of space to go. Obviously, the, the sort of bigger space is cross court. So I'm not giving them any sort of angles to attack. I'm being quite aggressive down in my court position. But we've got to tell each other what's happening. I need to know if I'm the net player where the serve's going to go. The server needs to know where I'm going to move after the serve because then our positions will change and we need to make sure that we cover space. And that's what we're going to look at in this first part. So who covers what? The service partner should position themselves between the most two extreme positions on the return. So that means if I serve down the tee, what are the two extreme positions or placements the returner can hit? 
And I've then got to put myself in the middle of those two extreme positions. But that also means if my partner goes T or my partner goes wide, they're going to be two separate positions. So I need to know where the serve's going to go. The server, dead easy. You just position yourself outside of that range. And the server actually has less court space to cover, which again, people get confused because they think the server should cover the entire back of the court. Absolutely not. And we'll look at the next slide why. And it's vital you communicate. You'll see players at the top level, they'll they'll go to the back of the court and they'll cover their mouth and they'll start whispering. And what they're saying is, okay, T wide, top spin slice, okay, poach, not poach, hold your ground, look to intercept. They're, they're sort of communicating the plan, the play. Because where the serve goes will have an effect on what space I cover as a server. And also the returner needs to position himself in the right place as well. So let's look at the serve and let's look at the wide serve. So the wide serve, I believe it's Jamie Murray in the picture. He's going to serve out wide towards the inside tram line. So the return is going to move roughly in line with this 78.5 degree um, stat you see on the screen. So the server themselves has the easiest job. They just have to cover anything to the left of that first yellow line. So anything from here. You have to understand that angle to hit there is going to be really tough. So they're really only going to have to cover probably halfway between the outside and inside tram line and here. So not a big space. They don't have to cover back here. They just have to cover just to the left of that line. Very small space. Easiest job in the world. The net player has the probably most important job because they have to protect that space now. So we know the serve's going wide. They've communicated before they served. Andy Murray, I believe, has to move between the two extreme points. Extreme point one, extreme point two. Yeah, anything here, Jamie's got covered. So Andy's got to cover from here to there, which is roughly right in the middle of the angle. Okay, so he's got to cover that. They're probably not going to lob. Probably. Lob has become one of the most effective shots these days in uh, doubles. And if they do lob, Jamie is going to be aware of it and move across. And that's when he protects the back. But if he tries to hit the passing shot, then he's got to put himself right in the middle. So let's have a look at in action. Serves wide. And then you can see Andy's position there. So he's moved across. So he's gone forwards, and then he's moved across to protect those two extremes. So extreme one was here, extreme two was here. So he's right in the middle. And you can see now they're forcing the returner to hit that really wide angle ball. So let's look at the movement again. And you can see how Jamie stays left, stays out wide. But what I want you to look at the second time around is watch how he moves slightly to the right because he knows Andy's going to go right. So he's going to move just a little bit over it as well. Just to just to protect that slight sort of difference in space. You can see there, he, so he goes from here and he steps in because Andy's took two steps across. And this is only played out because they know where the serve's going. Andy knows, and he's not watching the ball. Andy knows when to move. And a question I get asked quite a lot is, when do they move? So... Watch him. He moves on the B of the bang. He moves when the ball's hit. He'll also be looking at the returner for, for the cues because the, because the returner is going to be moving forward slightly and he's probably going to do a, a split step just before impact. So Andy's eyes are completely locked on the returner. So he's got a cue. So he knows when the ball toss is going up because because the returner is going to start moving. So Andy then starts moving and then he starts to adjust his position when he hears the impact of the ball. Now, these are top players. These are top, top players. If you try and do that at club level where the serves are a lot slower, it's a bit more challenging. So on this next slide, and it's just me with no friends, and what I'm showing you is how to move at club level. So I'd move forwards when I hear the, 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 the balls hit, and then just before contact, I'll shuffle across. I'll shuffle across and take up that position because... If I move straight to that wide position, 
on the impact of the ball. If the ball's really slow, by the time I get there, the return is looked up and now and now they see what's happening. So they're going to go for the space. So I'm going to delay it as long as possible. I'm going to move forwards, move forwards, ball bounces just before contact. Then I'm going to move across. I'm going to move across and cover that space of the wide serve because when your partner serves wide, the danger is the line. And again, I heard someone say on a workshop I did a few weeks back, oh, you should never serve wide in tennis. Why? <laughs> it's quite a good serve because it forces them to go back cross court. Um, oh, but, but then you but then you open up the line. Yeah, you open up the line, but then you just adjust your court position. And I want them to try and go down the line because I'm going to be in the right position now. So you can serve wide in tennis uh, doubles. It's not all about going T. So now let's flip it onto the T serve. And this and this way it changes a little bit. So the server again covers anything out to the two extremes. So the two extremes now change a little bit. So this is a lot more left, this line here. And why not all the way to the tram line? Because you have to understand and appreciate. I think it's Kyrgios down the far end. For him to hit that shot is unbelievable. If he if he hits that shot, it's a worldie. Let him hit it. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about it so much. If he hits it, fair play. Is he going to hit it all the time? Absolutely not. Okay. So again, I believe it's Murray again. He's a little bit central here to the left. Like I mentioned before, some of the top players are now going a bit more towards the center. And you probably notice Salisbury's quite, quite far to the center here as well. So I believe they're almost telegraphing where they're going to go. But the serve is so effective and so well placed that it forces Kyrgios to go back to Salisbury anyway. But if we're looking at territory, Jamie just has to cover this bit. Very small amount of space. Joe at the net has everything else covered. And like we mentioned before, Joe positioned himself in the center. He's almost sort of already pre-done it here. And we'll and we'll see why in the clip. So what they're trying to do. <laughs> what I mean. What they're trying to do, all right, is they're just forcing him. So they're, they're forcing him to try and go back to that tough shot, which we talked about. And because he's gone so far over, he's making him play it. He's shown him the space. Like we said before, he's shown him to play a shot that's really tough. Because if you look at the length and the placement of the serve, it's really in the corner. It's It's really tough to change the angle of the ball here. And... That's why these positions are so aggressive because they're forcing them. Now, I'm not saying that you have to take up the, such an aggressive position, um, but what I'm saying and sort of highlighting is if your partner's going to serve T, you've got to move towards more of the, the center service line. So let's just watch that one more time play through. There you go. He covers it. He's got it. Again, talk about good players, top serves, really quick. Let's let's break it down club level. So if we look at the T serve, again, look how I move. I'll move forwards on impact, and then I'll move across just before they touch the ball. So I'll move forwards. I move across just before they touch the ball. Just put myself in that position. Again, I don't have to worry so much about this. Because if I take one crossover step, I can intercept that ball. They're not going to hit that return from here and hit that angle. They're not. It's it's it, If they do, it's luck. It's luck at all worldy. But they're not going to do it consistently. So I put myself in that very aggressive position and I'm forcing them back towards me. Because it's going to be tough for them to hit the angle back towards the server. They're going to have to play down the middle. And I'm putting myself in that great position. And, and this is why, for years, we've always said, go T-serve. So poaching... That's not poaching, by the way. That's just holding a good position. That's just holding your territory. Poaching is completely different. So poaching up the serve is highly effective way to win points. By using the pressure of the serve, the server's partner can intercept the return to win the point. There's two types of poach. There's on command. So before the servers even hit the ball, I would turn around and I'd say to Jamie Murray, okay, Jamie, I'm going to poach on this ball. Because if I'm going to poach, my court position completely changes. It becomes much more aggressive. And we'll, and we'll sort of look at that now. Um, the other way I can poach is 
if I take up those positions we looked at before, so if I take up the position just to the inside tram line or the center line, but then I see that ball coming across me, I can then change into a poach. I believe that's a lot tougher, but it's a lot easier at club level because the, the, the speed of the ball is a lot slower. So you can have a poach on command or poach on reaction. So let's look at poach on command. So we're going to look at the wide serve again. Now, the server has to be careful here because the, the server's net player is going to move really quite far across towards the center of the service line or the center service line. They're going to move right across to the middle. So you can see I put the arrow there. They're going to move all the way across now. Yeah, they're not going a little bit across. They're going to go all the way across. So the server just has to be conscious of this now. They may have to change and go across the court. Okay. The server's net player, they're going to move forwards, but they're going to shift their position to the center of the court. So they, they, they're going to move a lot further across than before. And if they hit the volley, they're going to try and volley down the center. Volley down the middle, it's a really tough shot because one, it splits them. Two, it's very difficult to defend the volley here for this player. It's going to go low. It's going to go quick. It's going to go in behind them as well. I think I think he's right-handed in this clip. I think that's I think that's Jamie there, uh, who's actually left-handed, so actually a little bit easier for him. Uh, but going towards the back hip as well, which from a technical point of view, it's a tough shot. Let's have a look at it in action. So you can see he actually breaks past the center line. So this, I believe, is more on reaction because he'll move to his normal center position. And what you may notice is he doesn't actually go wide. He stays central because he wants to intercept a cross-court return. Watch that again. So he moves forwards, and then he moves across. So he intercepts. So rather than going out towards the inside tram line, he actually goes towards the center of the court, which is completely different. So that's, again, that's a poach on command, not re um, not reaction, sorry. So again, watch me here. A little bit different because obviously the, the, the cameras move around the other side. So I'll move forwards, and then I'll come across. So I'm looking to intercept that cross-court return. So it's a little bit like when I'm trying to hold position for the T-surf. I move across. I'm trying to put myself in the middle. Again, timing's everything. I move forwards when the ball's hit, and then I'll shift my body weight across. So it's a bit like a fake, I guess. I move forwards, and rather than going left to, to, to cover the wide, I go right. And if I do that at the right time, I'm going to get myself right in the middle of that cross-court return. And that's why I said before it's important here because... If I mistime that or the returner has already decided that they're going to attack the line, that's where the server has to move across and protect me. Now, the T return is completely different. So they're going to try and intercept, but they're going to move right across. So if you look at the player here at the top, he's going to come all the way across. Again, this is all about returning the cross-court ball. Again, it's important that the server might have to change sides because this player is going to come all the way across. So the territory now will shift and they move. The server's net player is going to move forwards, but they're going to go on the opposite side of the box. It's really aggressive. The volley now is to volley the ball away from the returner. So they may hit the volley in here, or he's going to volley in here. Let's have a look. doesn't even need the volley because what happens here is you can see the returner looks up and he's so conscious of, of the shot. And to be fair, it's a great serve as well. It really puts him under pressure, but you can really see the movement. Look how far across he's there waiting for it. So if that ball comes over, the Argentinian player is, is it, is, is there to, is, is there to play. And again, these are all set up pre- Pre-serve.
And you can see it here if, so when I slow it down. I'll move forwards and then I go all the way across. I'll get across into the other service box. I move forwards, move forwards, impact, then I come across. That's me looking to poach. So that's completely different to me looking to, to hold position, which was the first sort of module or the first examples that I showed you. I'm moving in and then I'm moving across and I'm looking to poach that T serve. Timing, as always, is everything moves forward. Ball's about to be struck. I move across and intercept. So the key teaching points for this, PMT, position, movement, timing. Get in between the two possible return angles. Yeah, so you have to look at where the serve's going to go. Again, this is all about knowing your partner as well. So if you know they can find those corners of that box, work out where you need to be. If they can't quite find the corners and it's a bit more towards the center of the box, okay, work out where you need to be. And this is where playing with your doubles partner often comes into sort of play because you need to know where they can find in that box. And then you've got to put yourself in between the two positions. Movements. Keep your shoulders forward to the returner as you shuffle. First step, same as the, as the poach to help disguise. So just move. Again, I find moving much more sidestep and shuffling is a lot easier because I, it just helps me take the ball maybe a little bit later. Um, and I can adapt and I can adjust my hands quite quick if I'm that open stance. Um, again, depends on the level you're playing with. But the movements, move forwards. Move forwards and you're trying to disguise it. And then you shift left or right, depending on whether you're going to stay or whether you're going to poach. And the timing's everything. If you're playing at a high level, you move on the B of the bang. If you're playing at a lower club level, you move forwards and then you adjust your position just before contact. And this is a great little diagram. So we've got the yellow, which is the wide serve. We've got the no poach, the stay, which again is towards the left-hand side of the court and the inside tram line. So they move forwards and they'll go left. But if they're going to poach, they're going to move forward, but then they're going to shift their body weight to the right and take up that central position. And that's why it's complete extreme. And that's why you need to tell the server that you're going to poach. Because if you don't tell them, the server's going to expect you to go left, but then all of a sudden you go right, you're going to leave this big space down the bottom. I've mentioned a few times, and I'll continue to mention it. Communication is key. If you look at the T-serve, to hold position, you move forwards, and then you take up that position towards the center line. If you're going to poach, you move forwards, but then you shift into the other service box. So the two poaching positions are very extreme. If you're going to poach, you generally look to poach across court. Yeah, poaching is not here. Poaching is intercepting getting in the way of the ball between you and the server. So when you poach, you either move forwards, take up the center position on a wide, or you move forwards and go in the other service box on the T-serve. And that's a difference. So the key communication points here is when you're having the conversation, I believe that the net player should say, okay, I'm going to poach or I'm going to stay. If I'm going to stay, I'm going to take up one of these two defensive positions. If I'm going to poach, I'm going to take up one of these two aggressive positions. And then the server just has to worry about getting the server in the right place. A question that I get asked a lot when I sort of deliver this in workshop is, well, I'm not that accurate with my serve. So what happens if we set it up that I'm going to serve out wide? Okay. But then my partner serves T. They miss hit it. They miss time it or they get the angle wrong. At club level, it's actually easy because if you think about all my demonstration videos, I move forwards first and then just before contact, I adjusted. So what I say in that situation is move forwards. If you realize they've gone T and not wide, you then just take up that T position. Yeah, if you move forwards and you realize they've gone wide and not T, you then take up the wide position. You just, you just change on the fly. You just adapt and adjust because tennis is not set in stone. It's open. Anything can happen. Big gust of wind might sort of bring the ball back in. So just adjust on the fly. I think if you're playing club level, it's easier because you can move forward and then adapt by changing based on the, the bounce or the position of the, of the serve. At a high level, generally unlikely, they're not going to find their targets because they're, they're so good at finding sort of the spaces. 
But again, you just have to adapt and change. It's it's not open and you have to be prepared to adapt. And I say this a lot again on workshops that I do. You don't have to win every point this way. You could play 10 points. You're allowed to lose a couple. Because again, you look at the stat before, 64%. So let's say six out of 10. If you win six out of 10, you should win the match in terms of the serving team. You're allowed to lose four. People think tennis players win every single point. Djokovic, what, wins 51% of his points. Yeah, you don't have to win every point. So if you if you try this, if you go out and you you lose a couple of points, don't let it get to you. Don't let it be disheartening. I'm going, oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm I'm literally going to stick to my ground. I'm, I'm losing too many points. Aim to win six out of 10. If you win six out of 10, you're in good position. Yeah, so don't get disheartened if you lose five. Just win the next one because that's the game. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to make errors. And you have to understand if you're the net player, you're going to make lots of mistakes because you're the one in the action zone. You're the one in the heat of the battle. It's just making that six out of 10. So please, please, please try this out. Hone in, practice it, but don't become disheartened if it doesn't work all the time. Because sometimes you just maybe play against a better team. But in my experience, if you put this into practice, you'll win more matches at club and county level because the majority of players have no idea about this. They just play. They play reactive tennis. They'll take up positions, like we said before, one up, one back, but they won't actually know why. Okay, so now let's look at dominating the net. So let's say the return is made. And we now move into ball four. Sometimes, no matter how good the server and net player, tennis has no guarantees. Yeah, you may have some good players on the opposite side as well. So the objective is when the ball is back in play, the net players they can't, uh, the net player realizes they can't intercept. They then have to move into a defensive position. So when that ball goes past them, and we're now into ball four territory, the net player has to move back. They have to move into a defensive position. If they stay forward, they're in danger. And the reason why the net player is in danger, because once the ball goes back to the server, they're going to hit ball four, which is going to go back over, or ball three, sorry. Ball three, it's going to go back over. So why is the net player in danger on ball three if they can't get the ball themselves? Well, once the ball goes past the net player to, to the server, ball three, the server is going to hit the ball back. The opposition net player now might intercept. And if they intercept your net player, the serving team, they're in trouble. They're a target. So they have to move into a defensive position. So let's have a look at it. So, so you'll see in this clip here, the serving team is set up. They've again probably discussed the poach or no poach and where the server's going to go. Look what happens when a net player realizes they can't intercept. Look how they will move back and defend their space. So they push back. And unlucky to win the point. So let's just play that through again. So watch. Serve. She moves forward. Can't make it. Then she pushes back because now the danger's in front. And now the danger is way in front, so she moves back even more. And that's why I said before, the net player has to move the most. They have to react to what's happening in front of them. If, if this net player just stays forwards, if she just stays forwards in that position, okay, then she's in trouble because once the ball comes back on this side, this player now becomes dangerous. Because if this player moves forward and intercepts this shot, look at all that space in behind. And that's why the net player will transition between attack and defense based on the ball. She moves forward, she moves back. She goes to move forward again, but then she now has but now she realizes the danger. Morning. Yeah, no one.
Thank you so much. Thank you. So when do we know when to move? It's all based on the ball. So the net player should move forwards when the ball's in front of you. So when the ball goes in front of you, you move forwards. Because, again, a bit like football or soccer, when you're attacking, you try and get as close as you can to the opposition's area. So when the ball's in front, you move forwards. When the ball goes behind you and you can't touch it, then you move backwards because then the danger then becomes in front of you. The danger becomes probably the opposition net player. So you have to move back to cover the most important space on the court. Most important space on the court is the center. So when my partner, which will say is the top X here, they hit the ball forwards, I move forwards. I'm looking to intercept that baseline of shot. But the baseline, it gets the ball past me. Good shot. Okay, now I move back. I move back because the danger is now here. Because this player is going to move forwards. But um, my partner hits a good shot back. So I go forwards. They hit it back. I go back. And I literally go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And that's why I said at the start of this presentation that the net player probably moves the most because they have to transition backwards and forwards. The baseline might not move that much. They, move, they, may, they, they may move a little bit side to side. Yeah, maybe a short ball here and there. The net players moving backwards and forwards. The most important part with this is don't watch the ball. Because if you watch the ball, you're in trouble because you'll look behind to see your partner. And then by the time it takes you to turn your head and look where the ball goes, this player may move into position. So what should you look for? When the ball goes forwards, your eyes on the baseliner. So when the ball's in front, the eyes on the baseliner. Once you realize you can't get that ball, your eyes then shift and your body then shifts across to the, to the net player. And you're watching the opposition. You're not generally watching the ball. Yeah. You, you only watch the ball just before impact here. Then once the ball's hit, you'll know if you can get it or not. If you can get it, you poach. If you can't get it, you, you then move back and defend. So the net player moves up and back. To summarize, when the ball's in front, move forwards. When the ball's behind you, you move back. So we talked about this before. So where to move to, you tend to move to the center of the court and back behind the service line. Back behind the service line will give you enough time to react to a volley. If you're too close, you can have less time and less space. And you cover the center because that's the danger. If they if they volley the ball in between you, it's going to be behind you and it's going to split you and your partner. And it all depends on the quality of your partner's shot. Yeah, how good your partner hits the ball depends on how much you move. If your partner gives away a really tough short ball, I might not move forwards. I might hang back a little bit. If they give out a really tough ball, I might move, sorry, a, a really tough wide ball. I might shift my body across and cover the tram line in that situation. So you really have to pay attention to your partner's shot, where they hit it and the quality of it as well. So what I said there, effective shot, puts opposition baseline under pressure, off balance, lack time or space. And that's what you're looking for. I, again, when you're watching the baseliner, you're looking at how comfortable they are. If they're off balance and they're, they're out of position, I'm probably going to look to intercept. If they're not off balance, but they're, let's say, comfortable, I might just look to move forwards and hold my position. A bit like the the first sort of um, serving positions we looked at, I may put myself in the center of the box, either slightly to the left, slightly to the right, based on if the ball goes wide or T. If they hit an unbelievably weak shot that that's short, then I might go back. I might go back towards the baseline because if, if that ball's short, the ball's coming at me. If, if you give me a short ball in doubles and you come to the net, I'm smashing that ball straight at you because you're going to be too close to the action and I've got all the time in the world to attack that ball. So let's look at the movement forwards when the ball's in front of you. 
So let's just look at the player here. And you'll see the player in red moves forwards and then they're looking to intercept. And now they're in an attacking position. They stay at the net. So just look how she moves forwards here. So again, look at the net player. Ball behind, stays back. Ball forward, starts going forwards. Holds back a little bit, but then goes forwards again. So she's reading the situation really well. Again, she's focused here. She's now looking there. Now she's focused there. Now she's looking. Now she knows that the other net player is out of position. Then she comes in to attack. Not the greatest volley in the world, first one. But you can see that they then both start peppering the net player because they're, they're the player with little time and space. A common mistake I see a lot of doubles players make is they're trying to volley deep. But this player's got lots of time. Attack this player. They've got less time and space. And you can see it played out here a little bit. So again, the focus of the attack now becomes this player. Okay, because they've they got little, little time and space. And even this player comes in, starts attacking the net player. <coughs> Pardon me. So now let's look at some backwards movement and the balls in front. So you can see here in the clip, the player in red's very aggressive. The player in white's moved back. They've moved back to create time and space. Again, a common mistake I see a lot is the white, player in white will stay here. And then you're literally just a target. She sees it. She moves back. She moves back now. She sees the danger. She starts going into defense. Might argue that that point should move over a little bit quicker. But to be fair, it was good defense um, from the team in white. Maybe the team in red should have put that first volley away. But just look at the net players. Just look how much movement they're doing. They're moving forwards and backwards. They're watching the opposition and they're trying to work out the space. That they're, they're, they're trying to work out that whether to be attack or defense. They're not static. They're always moving. Forwards, backwards, intercepting. And what they're looking for is the is the baseliner. Are they balanced or are they off balance? If they're balanced, then you can hit the ball anywhere. But if they're off balance, you've got opportunities to poach here. You've got opportunities to move across and try and intercept. And it's just about reading the game in front of you, reading oh, a great volley. It's reading the, the the interceptions. So moving forwards. A little bit of miscommunication there. Probably had a chat with them myself about that one. Um, but they're always moved, they're always moving. Again, we will look at this maybe in a future presentation about more effective net play. This is a slight overview. Um, but you you have to move forwards when the ball's in front of you, move back when the ball's behind you. And again, goes back to the positioning. Ball in front, you move forward, you look to intercept. When the ball goes behind you, you move back and you defend your space. You cover the line when the when your opponent's baseline is balanced, cover the center when they're off balance. Again, if they're off balance, that's probably a great opportunity to try and get in there and poach. If they're balanced, you just defend your space. Timing, timing's important. Again, you don't want to move too early if the game's a bit slower. You don't want to sort of te to, to, to telegraph your positioning. So just use the contact point. Use the contact point as a guide. And that's it. So a quite short, sharp presentation. Hopefully I've given you a better understanding of how doubles is actually played. I've highlighted the tennis skills from a tactical point that you need to play doubles effectively. Hopefully you have a better understanding of territory. What space do you cover when serving and when returning? Also, when you're a net player, how you move forward into an attacking position, how you move backwards to a defensive position based on the ball. And that's it. Thank you. This is the first of hopefully many short online presentations. Um, if you do want to get in touch with me, it's at my tennis coaching on Instagram and Facebook. We do have a Facebook group as well. My tennis coaching group. It is full of about two and a half thousand tennis coaches and tennis players who share ideas and content each and every day. Please feel free to 
find us on Facebook and join our little community there. It's really good, really engaging and lots of good content from some very top coaches as well. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you on court very soon. Thank you so much.